super fun panel, super fun topic. Everybody seems to be interested in this lately. Um, it was mentioned um, at least three times yesterday. Tyler and Cameron talked about it last night for dinner and did an amazing job at covering cryptocurrencies, why they're important, um, and why institutional money um, ought to come into the space, the importance for regulation, and also covered the volatility. And since we covered a lot of those topics already yesterday, and I had a conversation with Mike Milken two days ago, and he said, please make sure that you help everybody understand the distinction between Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Can you differentiate between Bitcoin and blockchain? And I'm going to turn this to Bill since you've been doing it for longer than anybody else. Uh, I, I guess the easiest way to explain it, all of you probably use the internet, of course, and you probably use email as an application on top of the internet, which is basically a, a layer of software, a protocol layer called TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol. So you can think of that as a tracking system that knows that if you know, Tyler sends an email to Suna, it knows that that's the content, it knows it goes into the stream, it knows where it pops out, and it records all that. So the, block, the blockchain is sort of like that transport layer, and you could think of Bitcoin or mm -hmm. anything else that rides on top of it as the container that contains something, in that case, not words like an email, but a piece of value. Mm -hmm. Tyler and Cameron, can you elaborate on exactly what mining is? So Bitcoin mining is basically, uh, I guess computers solve these mathematical problems, mm -hmm. um, and in doing so, they basically archive and validate existing transactions and archive them to the, the blockchain. So I sort of joke that uh, if you think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, that movie where Charlie's opening up these wrappers and looking for that golden ticket, if, for example, while he's doing that, he's actually simultaneously auditing the books of the Chocolate Factory and verifying them, in search for that golden ticket, and that golden ticket is sort of the reward that kind of incentivizes him to open up all those chocolate bars. That's kind of like mining. They basically audit and secure uh, the Bitcoin network and, and get it paid in Bitcoin. They sort of make so. sure that the, there's a double spend problem. So if I hand you a $20 bill, I can't turn around and hand it to Cameron because it's gone. <clears throat> but in the land of ones and zeros, how do I know I don't send the same Bitcoin to two different people? And that's called the double spend problem. So how do you create a finite amount of Bitcoin, a fixed amount of 21 million Bitcoin ever, when we know ones and zeros are plentiful, they're cheap, it's like cheap like oxygen. Um, so mining creates a digital scarcity. It creates, um, gives Bitcoin its finite uh, amount of like gold-like quality. Um, and so they archive and they're sort of like the referees of the network and they create this digital scarcity, which is a crazy concept to do, but they ensure that Bitcoin is like gold. It's, it's actually better than gold. It's not scarce, but it's actually fixed at 21 million Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Since you're mentioning gold, and um, yesterday in the Syntag conference, you were saying that um, you see it, um, see Bitcoin as a rival to gold. With its volatility, some people are saying that it can't be a store of value like gold. What are your thoughts on that? I think the volatility is a function of just a not a very sophisticated ecosystem yet. Um, we created the, the world's first Bitcoin futures with the SIBO, which allows people to actually short Bitcoin um, for the first time. So there's a, now a two-sided market, so it increases uh, price discovery and liquidity. So the more uh, you know, institutional money that comes into the space, the more um, liquidity, the larger it gets, the, the more stable it's going to be. Right now it's mm -hmm. a it's a young tech stock. And I think that it, we're just seeing, you know, what you'd expect to see if there is no ability to short a, you know, a public tech stock, um, you know, you'd see that kind of volatility. But I think it's going to level out once the futures contract picks up steam, once options are written mm -hmm. on, and then there's other products like ETFs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I think you're just going to start, start to see it like level out and look a little bit boring. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is like the opportunities now when it's volatile, when it's small, when it's risky, that's your opportunity to make money. You know, when there's a high risk, there's a high reward. When it gets boring and stable and kind of caps out at a couple trillion dollar market cap, there's really not much more room to go unless Bitcoin 
evolves mm -hmm. into being much more than just a sort of value or a, or a gold 2.0. Mm -hmm. I mean, gold has a th you know, three, 4,000 year head start in the spot market. There's gold ETFs, there's fu gold futures. There's all these you know, sophisticated financial products that presumably bring a lot of investors into the asset and also reduce volatility and increase price discovery. And Bitcoin's simply not there yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody on this stage would, would argue that. But I think the properties and the characteristics um, it could be, you know, gold in the future for sure. Mm -hmm. in our view. Since you guys were mentioning products and um, different instruments that are built on top of cryptocurrencies, um, and since Charlie's really involved with investing in ICOs, can you comment on the ICO market and why some people say that, you know, some of these ICOs are completely fraudulent and some of them are just a complete revolution in terms of making funding companies much more efficient. Sure, so I think that probably 95 to 99% of ICOs are fundamentally worthless um, and are essentially non-dilutive financing and venture capitalists have figured that out. Um, the ICO market, the way that it looks right now is mostly a function of the fact that um, it's highly speculative and speculation drives innovation. And I think that out of it, you will see a handful of very high quality, um, extremely disruptive products come out. Um, one of the examples that I frequently give is this project called Augur. It's a decentralized futures market. Um, the cost of contract creation is gonna be fractions of a cent. Um, you know, uh, it's generally pitched as a way where, you know, you could create a futures contract on the outcome of a presidential election, but beyond that, you can imagine that I now can speculate on, for example, SpaceX, create a contract uh, on you know, the valuation at their next financing round, and all of a sudden I have the ability to speculate on um, essentially anything in a decentralized way that can't be, um, you know, it's not really subject to regulatory pressures. Um, so I think that you'll see a couple of these things end up coming out and being wildly, wildly successful. Um, and you'll see a lot of stuff fade away into obscurity and nothing really happened there. Um, so, yeah, spe it's highly speculative. Speculation drives innovation and the market is obviously very young. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Mike, you also invest in a lot of ICOs and you have an incredible team um, that I work with quite a bit. And as you guys look at the ICO landscape, what are your thoughts on it? So I think what's important to, to get is that we're in this first stage of this blockchain decentralized revolution. And I call it the storytelling <coughs> stage. Uh, in any speculative mania, and we're in a speculative mania, it starts with storytelling. It's the story of what the future could look like. Mm -hmm. If you kind of go back to the mid-90s and the internet, we were telling this wonderful story about what the internet could look like. As it turned out, the internet way surpassed our wildest dreams, right? The internet is ubiquitous in our lives today. It determines elections, mm -hmm. the way our children date, the way we interact with each other. Every business has been disrupted by the internet. We, we didn't dream that in 99 but we were still telling these stories. And so right now the ICO market is a storytelling market. Uh, why? Partly because none of the blockchains, you know, think of the blockchains as public utilities that process uh, this information that's gonna go on databases are fast enough uh, for these new projects to actually run at industrial speed. And so each ICO right now is, is a story of what might get built. And so, you know, it's, because of that, it's all speculative. Um, in two to three years, you're going to start seeing decentralized uh, risk-taking, decentralized file sharing, decentralized online gambling, decentralized crap, you know, uh, uh, Uber or Airbnb. Uh, and real, real threats to the established, uh, the, the established companies show up. Um, but until then, really, we're, we're, we're talking about stories. And so when we invest, we look, you know, is there a great team behind, you know, does the token economics make sense? Is there a reason that this industry should be decentralized? Like, not every industry should be decentralized, right? Centralization works pretty good. Um, so is there a value proposition? Um, and, and, you know, because of it, 
Because of the frenzy right now, there's lots of bad products, bad, bad projects getting funded. Um, and I think Joey was right. A lot of these things will go to, I'm sorry, Charles was right. A lot of these things will go to, uh, mm -hmm. to zero and some will, will be revolutionary. I think it'll get a lot easier in two to three years uh, as we see real adoption. So you can, if it's decentralized gambling, you can see how many people are logging on and gambling. What's the revenue coming up? You know, how, how is the, the ecosystem growing? So these aren't currencies, right? These are, these are tokens that give you access to an ecosystem. And so you think about it, each one is a social network. You know, the real power of this thing is that the, the social network grows virally because the users become owners. And so it's a fascinating business model. Uh, and it is going to. I mean, I was out with one of the, the big pools of capital here this morning, and I was like, you guys need to invest something, not because you'll make so much on the investment, though I think you will, because in two to three years, the rest of your portfolio is gonna rely on you knowing what businesses are gonna be disrupted. I think mm -hmm. you'll see something launch, something big launch within the next year. I, I would not have said this. I've been involved with Ethereum since um, before the white paper was released and have been thinking about when we'll actually see something happen for a long time. Um, and in many ways, people are trying to sprint a marathon before, the, before we've crawled. Um, a lot of people expect that um, this stuff is going to happen very quickly, but to Mike's point, um, it's slow, it's hard to code, um, there have been lots of security bugs, and generally it's, it's just very, very nascent, but I would expect that you will see a few things release this year in 2018 that I think will um, start to give the market an inkling of, of what kinds of things will work and how wildly successful the things that really find protocol market fit and really are able to actually be disruptive, um, you know, how successful it'll be in practice beyond from a speculative perspective. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more on some of those applications and um, how disruptive that's going to be? Yeah, so a lot of stuff that's out there right now um, is very um, internal. So um, a couple of the things that Mike had mentioned, like gambling um, and, and things like that, are things that kind of touch the outside world. Um, and you're starting to see more um, you're starting to see more projects that, that do more than just kind of fix issues within the space. But I think that at the outset of it, um, most of the things that will launch and be successful and be widely adopted will be things that are kind of um, internal to the industry um, and don't go out and try to disrupt Airbnb yet. Um, and so examples of those would be Alger, MakerDAO, very interesting project, by the way, for finance people. It's essentially collateralized debt positions to create stable cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's, it's fascinating stuff. So um, Alger, MakerDAO, <coughs> ZeroX, a protocol for token exchanges. Um, you know, uh, fiat pair or currency pairs, you know, scale factorially. So it's um, kind of a decentralized protocol to try and help with token trading now that there's a couple thousand of these things already. Um, Omise Go, uh, project in Southeast Asia that's trying to do uh, very fast decentralized payments, already partnered with a couple extremely large companies, and I think that it'll be successful. It's also by Joseph Poon, which I think is Suna's favorite person uh, <laughs> in, in the industry. So good, good project. And there's, there's, a, there's a bunch more out there. There's, that's just a, a short list of my favorites. Um, but I think that two or three of those will launch this year. Um, and I expect, and Funfair, one that we did with Mike, a uh, decentralized gambling project. Um, I think that a couple of those will launch this year. Um, and that's pretty exciting because as of right now, there's no real active, large, successful project. Um, a couple smaller things have been done. Like if you, you guys might have heard of CryptoKitties. It's like a, uh, it's like cats that you can breed on Ethereum. <laughs> that's been by far the most successful project so far. So, you know, early days. But I expect that you will see soon, very soon. Okay. This is the first time I've ever actually made that prediction publicly. Something or some things launch that really start to give people more of an understanding of what will be successful and how wildly successful it'll be when it does launch. And will Bitcoin then be dethroned? I don't think so. I think so. I, I'll make a prediction that by 2020, Ethereum's market cap will be 10 times higher than Bitcoin's. Mm, that's an interesting bet. So I don't think so, partly because I think we're, we're still moving into this space and you know, Bitcoin is the standard bearer, and it has actually carved out this use case of digital gold. Uh, I was talking to one of my 60-year-old friends, uh, Stan Druckenmiller, uh, who's maybe the world's greatest speculator. 
and I'm only 53, and I was like, Stan, you're old, uh, because he was like, well, Bitcoin gold, like, you know, you can feel gold, but I was talking about my daughter, I said, you know, if I give my, my mother digital flowers for Mother's Day, my mother will look at me and maybe slap me, uh, and it, I'll hear a whole bunch of curse words coming at her, and, you know, uh, but if my daughter gets digital flowers from her boyfriend, she's like, oh, he loves me. Um, you know, our youth are growing up in a world that's digital. Uh, you go to China, no one carries cash, right? It's all electronic payments. And so as we shift into becoming more immersed in a digital world, uh, the idea of a digital store of value, the idea of digital gold makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, it doesn't for most of the guys in this room with bald heads. Um, I see a lot of bald heads out there. Um, because we didn't grow up immersed in our phones. Uh, esports, you know, we talk about esports and... Uh, you know, my brothers, who are all big sports fans, they were like, what do you mean esports? How about that, the League of Legends Super Bowl, which took place in the birdcage in Beijing, had 80 million people watch it on TV. That's more people than watch the NBA Finals in the US. Uh, and so it's hard to imagine that this whole world is shifting as fast as it is, but it is. And so I literally think of digital gold as will be, will replace gold over the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years, and gold's got an $8 trillion market cap, and Bitcoin's got about a $200 billion market cap, and so mm -hmm. I think of all the other cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin has kind of carved out this unique space. Um, listen, it could get dethroned, and I don't think it will be the blockchain that people buy and build things on, and so maybe Ethereum gets a, a higher market cap because it becomes the one that people build things on, but I don't think Bitcoin goes away. I'm so glad you mentioned the generational aspect because yesterday in the fintech roundtable you were saying it's really hard to understand the cryptocurrency and blockchain revolution unless you really understand um, its nascent roots and its anti-establishment um, nature of it and how this generation looks at things different um, than many yeah, of us. So Bitcoin really came out of the 2008 financial crises when people around the world looked at their, their banks, their governments, and said, oh my goodness, the world's falling apart, and we just don't trust these guys anymore. I don't trust that the bank's gonna protect my money because it looked like the world was falling apart. And so, you know, Satoshi, uh, man or woman or group of people, uh, you know, came up with this white paper with this you know, interesting concept of decentralized trust, where you don't need to trust the one person in charge. And it really resonated to lots of people, you know, from crypto anarchists to libertarians, but certainly to the millennials. Um, when you fast forward from 2008 until, you know, <coughs> 10 years, 2018, and you look around the world, there's a complete breakdown in trust. The, the, the United States Congress has the single lowest approval rating in its history. Our president has the single lowest approval rating of any president in its history. Uh, you know, the truth you know, what do they call alternative facts and truth. You know, so this idea of, of trusting the centralized authority is breaking down. Wells Fargo in the United States got in trouble for, for uh, you know, doing things they shouldn't have done. Equifax, our biggest credit agency, got hacked. And it's not just the United States. You look at places like Venezuela where the currency became toilet paper. Uh, you know, or, or all over the world there's been this breakdown of trust. And so, the, this decentralized revolution is touching something in people that say, hey, we want a different way. Uh, in a lot of ways, what got Trump elected in the U.S. was this group of people that felt forgotten, that said, we want something different. And Bitcoin and the blockchain revolution is a more productive response to that same problem, like people feeling left out want a different way. And so one reason it's not going away is because this is a millennial gig, and this is their, this is their revolution, and they're just not going to roll over. Mm -hmm. um, that's really helpful. And to your point around the massive disruption element, um, one thing that I think might be relevant to um, this region is the aspect of the petrodollar and how that's being... Yes, yeah, so this came up uh, in a conversation Sue and I had, because here we are in the land mm -hmm. of the petrodollar. Right. And, uh, you know, as I, I, because I've been involved in this space for so long, and I've actually kind of been amazed at how rapidly it's accelerated recently, it's really made me question why. Why is all this happening, and what, you know, what is behind it from a more systemic level? 
And you know, let me, I'll ask all the people in the room, what is more important to you if it got cut off? Your access to petroleum or electricity? And I would argue probably that most of you, if you like blacked out everything, that that would be far more disruptive to your life today than if you couldn't fill your tank at the gas station. Okay, so how does that tie the petrodollar? If you think about the history of currency and the dollar in general, you know, after World War II, you had the dollar anchored to gold, and then it, it was a reference point for other currencies. When the U.S. essentially forced people to make payments for oil with U.S. dollars, that effectively was like an ICO where you tokenized oil. Right, so that allowed oil to be stored. So it allowed countries to basically hoard and accumulate through, through their foreign reserves capital, which could be traded for oil. So it was energy security. If you think about the situation we're in today, electricity, because of the fourth industrial revolution, you know, the old industrial revolution with machinery made oil fundamental to people's lives. Now it's all software. All those gears and machines are software. Electricity is the thing. It is the lifeblood of all of our lives today. So I think what cryptocurrency is, it's essentially the tokenization of electrons as opposed to petroleum molecules. And it's becoming basically a reference storage for all of the things that are useful in your life. And it, it's, it's actually kind of profound. I mean, it, it's, there's, there's so many things that are ahead mm -hmm. because of the shift. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you can foresee that are ahead? Well, so, so mm -hmm. I think it's basically changing, it, it's, it's redefining societal structure back to what it was for all of human history. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a big mm -hmm. statement, but, you know, Mil Michael Milken was talking about, you know, human evolution over four million years this morning. So if you Google search how long have humans been around, you get like six million years. Society has been organized in civilized society for four or five thousand years. It's only been for 150 that we have had the societal structures that we have today that are big corporations where humans have been turned into a cog in a wheel. If you think about life as a caveman, you might like, you know, hunt with your friends for five hours in the morning, mm -hmm. fish in the afternoon with four different ones, gather with other ones in, in, the, in the day. So you were a molecule on a fabric where you could reassemble your life based on what you were interested in at that moment. You had a flexible life and you could drive your life through inspiration. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution and the change in the economic structure to economies of scale where the productivity model drove big corporations and the concept of a nation state to protect that. And it's only 150 years. So the other 5,990,000 years, people have been in this flexible fabric. Software is taking humans and allowing them to return to that state where you could basically abstract yourself off the page, connect with other people per your interest at any given moment. And you think about the job market today, the people of Charlie's generation, they don't work like your parents or their parents where you were locked in a company. You're basically working on 10 different things depending on what you feel like during the day, right? So I think we're redefining mm -hmm. society based on software and the currency is an expression of that because they're basically communities of interest. Just like, you know, the, the dollar dominance that we've had for the last 50 years has only been 50 years. And, and in all other periods of history, value exchange has occurred with many different flavors all over the place. And they were somewhat interchangeable. So I think we're just returning back to what we always were. You know? mm -hmm. um, Around the aspects of how all of this is evolving, and since um, Cameron and Tyler, you guys have really been at the forefront of this thought curve, um, what do you see are the second and third order systemic effects on society, um, in particular with regard to centralized institutions such as um, banks and the Fed and um, other areas that are so intrinsic to society, um, so much so that obviously we had to have a huge bank bailout by the government. And so everything's so intertwined these days. And like Mike Milken said yesterday during the FinTech roundtable, at some point bank branches will probably be completely obsolete. So to the extent that banks start becoming less obsolete and given that they're 
at such high valuations now. How does all of that um, unravel? And do you see it as a step function? Do you see it as a gradual function, if at all? And I know I asked George Bush the same question yesterday, and he did not have an answer at all. So I'm not expecting you to have an answer. I just think it's very interesting for us all to contemplate and think about. Yeah, I mean, I think there, the, there's probably a billion people in this world who are unbanked right now, and I think if the current banking system could bank them, mm -hmm. uh, they would have, and they'd be there right now. So yeah. I think blockchain and Bitcoin or things like that, decentralized networks, is probably the closest we're going to get to potentially solving that problem in our lifetime, which I think is very exciting, because all you really need is a connection to the internet. Um, and a private key address, um, and you're instantly in the Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network. Um, so I think that's pretty fascinating um, second order effect of this technology. It's probably not gonna happen in the next year or two, but I think as these technologies mature in the US, uh, we'll see an exporting to other parts of the world that truly need it and might be more impacted than, than we are. I mean. Um, I don't think anybody woke up and sort of said, hey, my credit card's not fast enough or this is really bothering me. Um, you know, we happen to be really interested in the technology, but um, the U.S. is arguably doesn't need it as much as a lot of right. other places in the world. So I think that's going to happen over the next five to ten years and will be really exciting. I, th I think to, to Bill's point, the, you know, the Internet started off as this open place. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Google guys uh, downloaded the entire Internet, apparently, on one computer that now sits in a computer science museum in San Francisco um, to work on their algorithms and you know, see if Google would actually work. Uh, today, you can't download the entire Internet because it's siloed in the, the FANG companies, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, maybe Microsoft. And so when you log onto the internet today, you're really logging on to one of five companies. And so you can't really download uh, the, all of the data that Twitter has siloed. You can't download all of Facebook. They control it, they centralize it. So in many ways, um, cryptocurrencies can decentralize all of this and move these companies that are siloed on the application layer down to the protocol layer so that this data is actually um, you know, democratically um, open and the internet's actually how it was supposed to be. It, used, it was supposed to be this peer-to-peer -peer open thing um, for everyone and not this centralized sort of um, dictatorship of, of five co company, five or six companies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it's, it's kind of interesting that the, the cryptocurrency you know, breakthrough is allowing us to go back to what this was always supposed to be. And I don't think it's a surprise that um, all of these companies were really late to adopt it or even speak about it um, because it didn't, doesn't really benefit them to, um, to disrupt themselves in a way. So, you know, you can argue that Silicon Valley very much missed, missed the boat on this, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's because they're not smart people and didn't see it coming or it wasn't in their backyard. They just didn't want to see it. It doesn't, you know, it's not a good thing for them. It's you a, think, oh, yeah, oh, go ahead. So it's a fascinating point. The, uh, I keep thinking, what's the killer app? for the blockchain and the killer app for the blockchain is identity and you know we give away our identity for free right now and I use the example of my daughter who's 22 goes to a bar she gives the the barman her driver's license and it has her address on it so why does this man who doesn't know her now need to know where she lives uh, it's just we do it as a function and so when you take identity back and when you take privacy back which the blockchain is going to allow uh, soon uh, it can change everything. You, the data that we give to Facebook for free, you can charge them for it. Uh, when I buy uh, my underwear online, next thing you know, the whole world knows I like pink underwear. <laughs> you know, uh, that's not oh, necessarily, you, uh, you know, th they're, they're right to know that. Um, Tyler and Kerber know it because they own the company. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, pretty soon you're going to wear the Apple Watch and your biometric data is going to go right to the cloud and someone's going to know, hey, you're 53-year-old male and your heart rate's 62 on average and they'll know what all the, you know, that data is wonderfully valuable. And so, you know, even, you, you could even kind of wax all the way to universal basic income just by living because your data is worth something. And so, I think when we can get to an identity, and there's lots of cool identity projects being built on. You know, in, in the developed world, there's two million people without identity. And so just 
through attestation. You know, I say this is Suna, all of us say this is Suna, and therefore she is Suna, and all of a sudden she's got identity. In the developed world, you add on your passport, your driver's license, and you're going to see a real revolution in, in, in things. And then you start becoming a real threat to the dominant uh, data owners, Facebook, Google. And so, again, as investors, uh, I keep telling people, put something in the space, maybe not even for the money you make in the space, but because in two, three, four, five years, all the, the landscape is going to shift. And the companies that you think are, are infallible uh, are going to be at least at risk. Now, I don't think any of these guys are just going to go to sleep and say, yeah, take my business away from me, right? There's going to be a fierce fight from Uber to decentralized Uber, from mm -hmm. Facebook. I mean, even Mark Zuckerberg finally woke up and said, hey, we're going to spend a lot more time thinking about this. Uh, and so it's going to be a fascinating uh, you know, game to participate in, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's market efficiency. Yeah, or it's, it's, not, it's not identity. I don't think that there's any one use case that will end up being the killer use case. And this is mostly from the Ethereum perspective um, or people that are trying to build applications on top of this. Um, so when you say things like, um, like there'll be a fierce fight from Uber, yeah, I think, that it's more, I think that you could create a much more efficient version of Uber on Ethereum. Someone already created a much more efficient version of Airbnb on Ethereum. Um, it doesn't have to be on Ethereum specifically, but on some blockchain, um, somewhere. And I think ultimately the, the killer app for all this stuff is just market efficiency. It's just finding markets where there are people taking rent seeking fees, where they're artificially illiquid, where there exists the ability for something to come in and, and I mean it's kind of like regulatory arbitrage, you know, for a lot of these things. And and really the killer app for all this stuff is that it can go and just, like a serial killer, find every single vertical where there exists some kind of inefficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and frequently, it's just such an obvious thing that um, you'll hear about it and you'll be like, yeah, yeah of course, this is going to be wildly successful if you're able to actually go out and build it. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's identity, allowing people to take their data back, creating global marketplaces where they're currently fractured, um, cutting out rent-seeking fees in any number of industries, it's probably the biggest one. Um, I think all of those things, pretty quickly, you know, like with a snowball effect, will be disrupted. Um, and that when it starts to happen, um, you know, again, I think, I think you'll start to see the, the beginnings of that in practice pretty soon, that it'll be very clear to people that um, this is real and it's actually going to come for an innumerable number of industries. I mean, the, the problem that I'd love to solve um, mm -hmm. is spam, right? If, if you had to send a cryptocurrency token, some small fraction to a server uh, before you send an email, you wouldn't be able to abuse that because it would become primitively expensive to send out millions of emails to random people and try and see who, mm -hmm. you know, took the bait. Um, if my server required you to pay me and then I could whitelist you and whatnot and create sort of a market dynamic forces to sending email, which is now absolutely cheap and, and no cost to the, the sender, um, all of a sudden, if you put a cryptocurrency market dynamic forces on that, um, spam email would be gone. That's just one of the obvious problems that this technology can solve, and there's so many more, um, and it's just beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would challenge you to just think about it, though. Like, there's in almost every example that I hear people give, and the email one's a fantastic one, right? Because it's super annoying to open your email and just, and, and you know, it, it's awful. It, like, it shouldn't exist. It, it shouldn't exist in 2018. There's no reason for it to. I, I would say similarly, there's no reason for Airbnb to charge the fees they do in 2018, but, you know, it's a less immediately solvable problem. Um, but when I think about this stuff, in almost every example that people give, there is an obvious rent seeker, or there is an, or there, and whether or not it's immediately obvious, um, like with the Airbnb example, um, or whether it's just people don't want to solve the issue, like with the spam email thing, um, people don't really want to solve the issue because um, there's, there's an inefficiency that exists there from being able to gather more data on people, essentially, with the spam email issue. Um, what, that, was, that was a little less clear, but, but almost all of these examples, you can kind of find uh, and latch onto some 
facet of it that is just clearly inefficient and should be solved, and you're like, why hasn't this been so far? Why is no one able to disrupt this, whatever? And, and, and in almost every example, um, if you give it some thought, it's, it's like uh, it starts to fit the same narrative um, for all these different things, even when they're wildly different for the reasons that they will be disrupted. There's, there's like an underlying narrative that's really just like the you know, decentralization rebel ethos kind of is for a long time, you know, the crypto anarchist ethos, but um, that all these things fit and that when you really start diving down into this stuff, I think that's why you go down the rabbit hole is that you just start to see this overarching narrative that you know, I, I can't come up with a convincing reason why it wouldn't work you know, in the end, even with every hurdle that it's jumped over so far and will have to jump through. Thank you so much. Um, what I love about aspects of everything that everybody here has said is that once people start thinking about this, often you know we call it going down the blockchain rabbit hole. You start thinking about all these different things that um, can be massively disrupted and what the future can look like. And so before I open up um, to audience questions, I wanted to ask each panelist to point out one thing that um, everyone in the audience can do to start becoming involved in this revolution, whether it's buying one Bitcoin or going on Gemini or you know buying a certain book or going on Coindesk. So um, I'll start with you. Yeah, you can sign up to Gemini.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's this digital asset exchange custodian run by these two twin brothers. Um, and you can buy Bitcoin and Ether, um, and you can custody it with us. So that's a good way to start. I always think that um, getting skin in the game is a great way to sharpen your senses and encourage you to, and galvanize you to actually start learning about something. Same advice. <laughs> you know, I think uh, it's uh, like Mike was saying, you know, as a fund manager or an investor, you just, you just want to be in the game to learn. And, you know, I think, uh, I think it's probably useful to, so having started as an equity venture capitalist and then finally doing Bitcoin and passing on Ethereum because I thought, oh, I'm already Bitcoin, you know, the, the ICO wave was crazy to me when it first started, but I, I now have actually participated and launched a couple of them. And I think it would be very useful for all of you to buy one or part of a Bitcoin a little bit of Ethereum, and then just test the water with an ICO because the, the mechanics of how you transact and acquire each one of those is slightly different. Mm -hmm. And or they're, you know, they're close, but the ICOs in many cases are different because you have to navigate sort of a world of like which exchange and you know, it's, it's, it's something to learn and you will see the problems in the system that need to get fixed by all the developers as you start to use each of those coins, because all of them have some, I wouldn't call them flaws, that they, they, they have things that need to be improved that the developers are working on, whether it's transaction speed or, or uh, lots of like, you know, gaping holes in the technology in Ethereum or, or uh, you know, in, in, dep depending on the ICO, what is the business model? You know, so I would experiment in, in, in all of those. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I spend most of, most of my time down in the trenches with this stuff. I don't get the opportunity to talk about it from a high level very often, uh, which I enjoy, so thanks, Una. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say buy some Bitcoin, buy some Ether. Um, try just sending it to a friend. Try posting on Reddit or wherever and giving some away. Um, try participating in an ICO try trading some of these tokens. And if you can, try and figure out who your counterparty is when you're trading those tokens. Um, the moment that it really clicked for me and a couple of my friends um, with the token market specifically, because for a long time I was a massive uh, you know, Bitcoin fan, and even though I believed in Ethereum from the early days, I wasn't really sure where it would find its, uh, its niche. But buy some tokens and give them away or trade them with someone and try and find out who your counterparty is. Um, for me, it was, a four, the first one was a 14-year-old kid in Bangladesh. The second one was, uh, I think, a 70-year-old woman in Japan. Um, and, and, you know, I think that uh, it'll start to give you an inclination of, of just how different this feels from whatever you would expect or be used to. 
Um, and, you know, you can start to kind of get an inclination for, for where this could go if it's successful. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great point. This is really the first global speculative mania of any of our lifetimes. Um, it's 100% global. Sometimes there's 30% of the volume that happens in Korea and Japan. Um, I got interviewed by CNBC Africa uh, in India. Um, and so we've never had a global mania. And so it's a, it's a really interesting point. Uh, my advice is uh, a little different. It's to go on Twitter. Um, mm. The crypto world lives on Twitter. You can follow Bill mm -hmm. Tai. He's got a pretty good Twitter, or even myself, uh, at No Regrets on Twitter. Um, and why I say that is because I didn't understand. I uh, underestimate a little bit how fast the, the market would grow until I went on Twitter and realized just how viral this thing is. Um, there was a, a few weeks ago I made some comment about one of the coins being overvalued and you know at a stupid price. And by the end of the day, 800,000 people around the world had read that comment. Um, and I only have 60,000 Twitter followers, and it was just how fast and viral the nature went. And it got me thinking about, you know, this is because it's all out there and because it's, there's awareness already over the world that the, the adoption, both as users, but then as users bring in, you know, programmers and young guys like him who dropped out of school because he saw this as an opportunity. Uh, I literally flew over uh, from New York with four college dropouts. Uh, <laughs> on my plane, all under the age of 20, all from the best universities in the United States. And so, you know, there's something going on here, and, and Twitter's a good way to, to... Now, there's a lot of junk on Twitter, too, but you'll get some sense of the passion of the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so um, any questions from the audience? So I'll take three questions, and I'll take them <coughs> all at the same time. I'll write them down and then re state them. You talked a lot about uh, the, the revolutionary aspect of this. Governments don't like revolutions. And so you have governmental regulatory control that is starting to happen because of ignorance or whatever you want to call it. How do you all view that, both from a U.S. perspective as well as a global perspective? Mm -hmm. all right, then I'll take the second one. Hi. Um, I asked this question yesterday to one of the twins. I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know which one. Yeah. but. Um, it, it, was, it was about the, the money laundering, and within uh, the blockchain, there's a ledger that identifies the providence and the history of the transactions. How is that not a powerful tool against money laundering? Because, you know, all the authorities are, you know, this is the big criticism, and, you know, it's a scaremongering, I think, type of concern, but I understand there is some type of technological solution that can use that power of blockchain to combat money laundering. Why isn't that being... Out, why isn't that out there in the media when all, only the negative side is? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one other question. Um, thank you so much. Excellent time. Excellent uh, topic. Uh, I guess it's a, it's a two-part question, and one just as a follow-on on a very interesting comment that was made, which is the comparison between the petrodollars and, and basically the tokenization of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, my issue with this is, is very simply, it's, at the end of the day, what produces electricity? It's natural gas, it's a natural resource. So, so the tokenization should be for that rather than the internet itself because without that, we wouldn't have an internet, we wouldn't have electricity. So again, you go back to, 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 the, to the fundamentals of you know, what people want, which is you know, the energy, regardless of where that energy comes from. So I think that, that for me sort of defies a bit the comment. The second part is I continue to um, fail to understand whether we're looking at a currency or a commodity. And at the end of the day, it's all a function of, it's a relative base. When we look at currencies, it's, it's the dollar versus the euro. It's uh, the euro versus the yen. Today, I think because of the fiat money system, what people don't realize, it's actually all of the currencies have been devalued against the, the, the gold because gold is considered not as a commodity but the ultimate form of currency. If Bitcoin becomes that, at the end of the day, I need to be able to use it to buy goods. So what determines the value? Because wh whether it becomes $20,000, $100,000, or a market cap of $7 trillion, that's $7 trillion. We continue to base it in the ultimate currency form, which is the dollar. If you take that outside of the system, then what is that relative value compared to? And, and I think that's the issue. And if you go back to the basics, it's gotta be you know, the basic needs of human beings, which is you know, a place to live, 
and, and ability to buy uh, essentials like food and clothing. So I, I still fail to understand, I get the technology side of it, but I don't understand as a means of communication, how will that be able to, to sort of replace what we have today and how will it be actually different rather than just be a form of, of you know, digital. I know, I'm sorry, I took too long, but <laughs> uh, I'd love to hear the, the, the panelists' thoughts on this. I'll, I'll take a crack at that, uh, and we can go backwards in the questions. Mm -hmm. um, listen, right now, you're better off to think of these as commodities. Ethereum as a fuel to run the Ethereum network. You know, Bitcoin as gold, which is a commodity. Um, you know, the big question is, the U.S. going to lose its power as the reserve currency, right? When you ask people what they're worth, they think in dollars, they don't think in euros or yen or, um, but in, in reality, it, if Bill's point is right, and we're seeing it in small scales as these new little social networks and ecosystems start trading within their own, you know, dollar dominance might end up falling, right? We've got debt to GDP around the world as high as it's ever been. Uh, the U.S. is in a bit of a, you know, at least cyclically in a retracement mode from, from its, its, place as the global leader, right? We've got an isolationist street going through the U.S. right now. Uh, China's on the rise. Uh, it was very interesting that at Davos two years ago, President Xi showed up and he was quoting Abraham Lincoln and reaching out and being a globalist uh, when Trump was pulling back. And so that, that drama is going to play out on a global scale. Uh, we're years away from the token economy being relevant enough uh, in the world that people will start thinking in terms of, of you know, Bitcoin. And so there's going to be these transitions. I mean, what C Cameron and Tyler provide is a way to get money out of the token world and into the fiat world and back and forth. Those gateways are going to, I think, be a lot more efficient in the future and be very important. Um, and so I don't think, well, it'd be an intellectually interesting argument to think about in the next 10 to 15 years, it's not as relevant. And so if you think of them as commodities and access to new ecosystems and infrastructures, it's a probably healthier way to think about the system. Janet Yellen said, uh, when someone asked her, like, you know, you'd have to move the decimal place, you'd have to move the decimal like eight places for me to, for me to you know, give this any amount of mental energy. Uh, it's, as a pragmatist, right, and someone who believes in this a lot, I mean, there's no point in really talking about is this going to overtake or overthrow the U.S. dollar? At what point do we start denominating it in Bitcoin? Like, you don't need to. Um, this can be wildly successful, and we can be on the trajectory for it to be as wildly successful as we want it to be without thinking about that for, you know, the foreseeable future. Um, and... So it's, it's kind of like, you know, it, the, the point at which we start having a serious conversation about uh, Bitcoin versus the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, you know, I don't, I'll be so happy that, you know, it, it's, 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 it's fine. People have used, they're, they're, what I've seen in this whole, I've been trying to get people to participate in this market for four or five years now, and there's this series of excuses that people give themselves. This is one of them. Well, I, I can't figure out the 20-year the future or quantum computing or, um, and there are a thousand reasons why not to invest in a speculative technology. Uh, you're not going to know all the answers. Uh, we don't know the future. Uh, the point I'd make is, listen, I was a pretty practical guy who spent my life as an investor. There's enough good stuff happening that you'd be foolish not to do a little bit of investing, mm -hmm. to put a little bit of your money in, to put a little bit of your intellectual capital into the thing. Um, because there's a shot that all your skepticism might be wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that is such a great point. Um, to, again, going backwards with the questions, um, in terms of tech solutions for money laundering and other... Yeah, actually, that, mm -hmm. that's actually... There, it's not in the press so much, but there are things, you know, at, at the Necker Blockchain Summit, we started something called the Blockchain Trust Alliance, and it's a coalition of, uh, you know, Interpol, Secret Service, IRS, you know, it's people like that that actually do use tools. Um, there, there's tools like Bloxy or, or Elliptical mm -hmm. where you can literally, you know, if, if Suni and I hadn't met and she said, send me some Bitcoin, I could copy paste her address, put it in the search box, hit enter, and I could see how many coins are in her wallet and I can see every transaction in or out of that address that she's mm -hmm. ever done. And then I could follow the money. So there may not be a name to it, but once you break that chain and you identify, it's like identifying an email string 
you, you can identify everybody along the line. So it's actually, it's, it's, it's easier to launder money with US dollar bills in a suitcase mm -hmm. than it is with Bitcoin. Yeah, and it, it just makes a better uh, media story. It's a sexier story to talk about bad people using Bitcoin and for illicit reasons and, and Silk Road and the, and the dark web. But um, you're absolutely right, the, the question. Um, there are forensic analysis tools. Um, the people, who, the agents who actually busted Silk Road, uh, one of them absconded with some of the Bitcoin and was tracked down by these tools. We got the email from Bitstamp about that. What's that? At, at Bitstamp, we got the email about that. Like, yeah, hey, I'm pretty sure this guy's stealing all. <laughs> and then the first time in hit that I can remember, they, an agent that did a bust of some sort, you never hear about a drug bust where the money was taken and then the, you know, the cop was arrested because uh, cash is actually you know, untraceable and anonymous, whereas Bitcoin, um, you know, a even bad guys and even agents who are doing bad things get busted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Bloxier, which Bill pointed to, they do a ton of work for the FBI, the SEC, the IRS, and it's all actually incredibly trackable. So um, that really ought to be one of the stories. I mean, it's arguably <clears throat> one of the problems of Bitcoin that it's too open. And so there's projects mm -hmm. like Zcash that are trying to restore mm -hmm. privacy to movement of funds and flow of funds. Um, and I think the media just enjoys promoting this false narrative. It's truly fake news. Um, <laughs> but I think it's important to approach yeah. this space with a beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. um, there's some very smart people uh, like Warren Buffett who will tell you this is gonna end badly. Um, he's an octogenarian and he missed the internet, you know, yeah. and he doesn't even like the internet. So I, I think that, you know, he's a status quo kind of guy. I think Jamie Dimon's a status quo kind of guy. Things are really good for them. Um, they don't get paid to look around corners. They get paid to sort of monetize the here, the now, um, and arguably rent seek in a lot of ways. So I think it's important to, as Mike was suggesting, get a little skin in the game, mm -hmm. even if you're just trying to learn, if you're not even trying to look for a return, because it's going to transform our lives. Uh, there's no question in my mind, um, you know, people, a 14 year old in Bangladesh, to Charles's point, um, you know, the fact that they're playing with ether. They can participate in a capital market for the first time. Yeah, they can yeah. participate in, in a capital market yeah. for that, the first time, literally. And that 14 year old is not going to, to get access to US equities mm -hmm. anytime soon. And they can build on these open, permissionless yeah. systems. So we really can harness, a blockchain can harness mm -hmm. the human capital of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's probably the first time ever. You know, Silicon Valley companies have access to. Who, can, who is basically sitting on that soil at that time? Um, and clear, you know, that's hard to get there. Um, it weeds a lot of people out. So I think it's really exciting, the mental capital that we will have coming, that's already in the space and that's gonna be continuing to come in the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so exciting because it's so power to the people, truly, to that point about the 14-year-old. So then in terms of how regulators really deal yeah, with so that, to, to first Jack, question. To Jack's question, mm -hmm. listen, you know, this started off and it still is at some core value about not trusting the center. And so it's in direct opposition to the people that are in the center often. Now, the practical side is you're not gonna have this technical revolution that we're talking about uh, without collaborating with, with the authorities. Yep. Uh, you know, the authorities aren't gonna say, oh, just take over. And so, you know, our company, all, all of the guys up here are constantly working with the regulators. You've seen different responses in different countries. The SEC was just out two days ago. And they were very optimistic and forward thinking. They said, listen, there's a lot of fraud and we're gonna go after bad actors and fraud, as we should, right? A regulator's job is to protect the little guy. And the little guy was making a lot of uninformed investment decisions uh, based on a lot of you know, fraudulent propaganda. And so I think you're gonna see some, some, some severe crackdowns on some of that. But they don't wanna kill the innovation golden goose that could lay all these eggs. Other countries like China, more, more threatened by a decentralized system, have been a much bigger crackdown. My personal view is China's cracking down just long enough for the Chinese companies to get good at this. Um, and then they'll kind of roll out the Chinese version of a decentralized system. Um, oxymoron. Um, and so you're gonna see different responses around the world. I do think the US regulatory response will be the leading one and people will follow. And so we're pretty optimistic. Um, you know, it, it's good for the, for the community and for the, the ecosystem to actually get some clarity around the rules. Uh, most regulators, because this is so new, have been 
been reticent to put any clarity out there. And so I think over the next couple years, you'll see, you'll see, you know, more established rules. Uh, we're going by, at our company, by the basic fact that, you know, just behave well and behave like you were behaving if you worked at Goldman Sachs. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not, that's not the, the ethos in the, in the system right now, but I think behavior. it'll move to. Is that Goldman Sachs good behavior? <laughs> <laughs> to your point about progressive regulation, so Japan um, last April declared Bitcoin legal tender. Um, and so final point about that, I'll let Bill wrap yeah. up because so he I, has yeah, a specific yeah. theory about yeah, why. Yeah, we do have to wrap up. You know, how, I'm sure all of you have been to Japan and dealt with Japanese businessmen and you know how, how like consensus oriented and how slow moving they are and how they will never make a decision like off the cuff. So just think about that because I had been involved in Bitcoin for so long and when it hit 20 bucks, I was surprised and 100, I was surprised and it was at 1300 and the Bank of Japan said it's legal. Gapped up to 3000 and I, I was blown away you know, if you think about, picture yourself as a banker in the room with the group of people in suits mm -hmm. at the Bank of Japan, sitting on the third largest GDP in the world with a massive amount of debt, a xenophobic culture where you have no young people anymore because it's kind of upside down, and they've been doing quantitative easing for 15 years before it had the name quantitative easing with negative interest rates, right? So you're sitting there saying, what am I going to do? What do you do if you are governing that money supply on that economy? And, and you, you may or may not have noticed, like any time there's a scandal in Japan, like, like the Toshiba thing, there was a giant hole in the balance sheet that was there for 15 years, <laughs> but you just didn't know because they're covering it up, right? So I know it's a little wacky theory, but I, I think they, they don't make decisions off the cuff. And I think that economy, people have been shorting JGBs for 20 years and losing their ass, you know, but mm -hmm. I think they may be worried that to your point about you know what happens to these fiat currencies over over cycles these things end you know and if you were running that money supply and your real concern is social stability and you think the system's going to blow what are you going to do you know they announced in april eight weeks from now two hundred sixty thousand retailers are going to be bitcoin enabled and this is a, a country that is like really slow right so so my theory <laughs> You know, put a little Bitcoin in every citizen's hands, and when the gasket blows, that Bitcoin goes to a million a coin, and everyone's good. It's, it's, it's a great point. I mean, the, the average lifespan of a currency is 27 years. So the U.S. dollar, you know, is an anomaly for sure. It is. Um, and the countries that adopt these things quick or earliest are going to have a huge potential opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, just for the note about, uh, like, regulatory pressure, so, like, I, I'm clearly a... Uh, you know, ideologically fairly radical about this, but day to day, uh, it's not that hard to be a functional pragmatist. Um, in the U.S. specifically, you know, we meet extremely uh, frequently with the SEC, CFTC, et cetera, about these issues, and it's it's not hard to be participate in this market in a way that's functionally pragmatic. And and you know, um, I don't think that uh, I, I think it'll be an ongoing conversation um, with regulators and governments, but one that. So far, we've seen zero um, evidence for, you know, uh, sort of just bringing the hammer down type response and, and uh, indiscriminate regulation. So. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, Thank you. good luck with all your purchases in Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs>